Hello everybody. Um, okay, this lesson is going to cover the material in chapter 3. Uh, there's a lot here. Uh, I certainly don't recommend reading this all in one sitting. You'll, you'll kill yourself or get bored to death. But, uh, you know, in this chapter we're going to talk about the models that are used to plan health promotion programs. And I want you to think of a model as a tool. So if you were going to plan a wedding, if you were going to plan a vacation, you know, there are tools out there uh, to help you do that, sort of a, a road map, if you will. So the steps that you would need to go through from the time you thought about the need for a health promotion program until the time that you actually got to implementing and evaluating it. So there are a lot of different models here. Um, I'm going to hit the high points of some of them, and then um, you know, through your reading and, and getting into detail, uh, you can you can learn more about them. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so here are the learning objectives for this particular lesson. Um, you know, you need to be able to know why you're using a planning model. So explain the value of that. Uh, explain what the general planning model is and what uh, those steps are and how that relates to some of the other things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, identify key models that are used in planning health promotion programs and briefly describe each of those. Uh, identify the basic components of the planning models presented and explain how they relate to the generalized model. And finally, be able to select and apply a model to a health promotion program that you uh, might be planning this semester or sometime in the future. All right, so here's some of the key terms, and a lot of these terms are actually the models that we're going to be using. Um, you know, health promotion folks love to use acronyms, and so a number of these things here like APEX, PH, MAP, PATCH, uh, PRECEED, PROCEED, etc., are acronyms that stand for certain things that we'll see. But uh, again, um, you know, keep these things in mind uh, as you uh, listen to this, and as you do the readings, uh, will help you to prepare for the next uh, or for our first quiz, which is coming up at the end of this week. All right, so um, one of the things that I want you to remember as we go through this is what uh, is called the three F's of program planning, and those are fluidity, flexibility, and functionality. And I want you to think of, uh, of a health promotion program as being uh, kind of like the water flowing down the river. Um, it's, you know, it, it's fluid. It uh, kind of goes logically from one point to another. And, um, uh, you know, it has a start and it has a finish to it. And also the term flexibility means that as we go through the process of uh, planning, implementing, and evaluating a health promotion program that, you know, some things, sometimes things change along the way. And so we need to be flexible in what we do and how we do things. If we see that something's just not working, then we need to uh, kind of drop back and, and uh, make some changes so that you know, we don't continue to do something that's not effective. And finally, functionality means that the things that we do, we want them to work. Um, you know, I think that's common sense. So uh, whatever we do, uh, we want to make sure that it's based on evidence, theory, best practices, and that um, uh, it's going to demonstrate an impact with the priority population. So keep those three F's in mind. All right, and so here are the models that we're going to be looking at in this chapter. It's not all of them, but it's uh, kind of the high points, the generalized model that we introduced uh, back in the first lesson, uh, a model called Precede, Proceed, MAP, MAP at SMART, SWAT, uh, Healthy Communities, and so on and so forth. All right, so just to refresh your memory, here's the five steps involved with the generalized model. You know, why is it called a generalized model? Because these are the steps that are usually in some way, shape, or form in all of the other models. So if you were to take all of the other program planning models that we're going to look at and lay them alongside this generalized model, you will see these steps in some way, shape, or form in most of the other models. So assessing the needs of the, of the priority population and goals and objectives to meet those needs, developing your interventions to make sure that you meet your goals and objectives, then implement the interventions, and finally uh, evaluate the results. 
All right, so back in 1983, the CDC came out with uh, the PATCH model, and PATCH is an acronym that stands for Planned Approach to Community Health. Um, so if we're trying to do something in a community, the PATCH model would be a good one to, uh, uh, to use in our, in our planning efforts. So step one, mobilize the community, get them engaged, get them excited about it collect and organize uh, data that will help you to determine uh, where the problem is, what we need to do about it. Uh, choose the health priorities and target groups. Uh, step four, choose and conduct or implement the interventions. And finally, evaluate the process and the interventions. Yeah, pretty simple. And again, can you, can you lay that alongside the generalized model and see the similarities there? Okay, then CDC and some other organizations in 1987 came out with a model called APEX-PH, another acronym that stands for Assessment Protocol for Excellence in Public Health, and it was specifically designed to help public health departments do uh, assessment and uh, intervention planning in the community. And so there are three essential phases here, the organizational capacity assessment, uh, the community process, and there are three uh, steps under that, and then finally completing the cycle, uh, which includes implementation and evaluation. So what's different here is that it requires a, a stage of looking at in, internally at your organization. You know, what kind of shape are you in? What kind of capacity do you have? Um, how many staff members do you have? What's your budget? In other words, are you as an organization ready to take on uh, this um, this health promotion uh, project. And then in the community process, what you want to do is, again, look out in the community at the health status of the community, uh, get opinion data, uh, interviews, focus groups, and so on from members of the community about what they think the priority should be, and then develop your action plan with goals and objectives. And then uh, stage three, as I mentioned, is an implementation and evaluation uh, phase. All right, and now we get into a model that's been used um, very widely in health promotion. Um, some have estimated that of all of the health promotion programs that have been done in the history of the world, well, not really, but uh, certainly in, since in the last 20 to 30 years, about 75% of them have used the pre-seed proceed model. So it's a very, very uh, common model. You'll see it a lot. Uh, I would be surprised if you hadn't heard of this in some of your other classes. So again, Precede Proceed is an acronym. Precede stands for, and I don't intend for you to have to remember this, but I want you to focus on the words predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling causes in educational diagnosis and evaluation. Uh, the, the word precede means, okay, the, these are the things that we're going to do first followed by proceed, which will come, uh, come next. All right, so again, focus on the words predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling causes. So we're looking for the causes of the health problem and then determining uh, what we can do about it. And proceed, another acronym, and you know, you'll see some important words here. I don't think the flow of them necessarily makes sense, but uh, um, you know the words do. Policy, you know, policy is critical in health promotion. Regulatory, uh, again, rules and regulations that govern our behavior uh, and organizational constructs. So we're looking at the culture of an organization, and then uh, educational and environmental development. Uh, obviously, some of our strategies can be educational in nature. Others can be, uh, you know, changing systems and changing the environment to make it easier for people to make uh, good choices. All right, so uh, keep those, keep that acronym in mind as we look at the the flow of the various stages for the Precede model. Okay, so here's. Um, uh, a diagram of the precede proceed model, and you know what's interesting about this is, you know, typically we'll read from left to right. Well, in this one, we start at the top in the orange boxes, and we go from right to left, and then we circle down to the bottom and go from left to right. So that represents the eight phases of the precede proceed model. So those phases are, first of all, the so social assessment, 
um, you know, looking at the environment, looking at the quality of life of the individuals in the priority population. So if we think about Harrisburg, um, you know, I asked you to do a windshield assessment as you went out to the Harrisburg neighborhood. You know, what kinds of things did you see? Some of you mentioned um, some dilapidated housing. Other me others mentioned, you know, people kind of hanging out on the street corner and maybe... Um, Maybe there was some crime in the neighborhood, not that you saw any, but uh, maybe you heard about that. Uh, poverty was something that a lot of people mentioned. Um, so, you know, those are things that go into that social assessment. And then phase two is the epidemiological assessment where we would look at secondary data and determine what the... Um, uh, what the status is of the health of the people in the community, what's the incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, cancer, and so on and so forth. And then we'd start to look at, uh, in phase three, we'd look at the, the, the causes and categorize those causes. And you saw some of these words in the, uh, the PRECEED acronym, but looking at predisposing factors, looking at reinforcing factors, and looking at enabling factors. And so um, you know, those things that we identify as causes of the problem, and then we develop our interventions to address those causes, if that makes sense. And then phase four, we're going to look at policy. So we're going to look at uh, administrative and policy issues that are either there or not there, uh, and we're going to uh, align our interventions with the causes from, from phase three and also with uh, some of those policy uh, initiatives. So, for example, if we were doing uh, health promotion in the schools, um, we might look at the school policies around um, the food that's served in the cafeteria or, you know, what are called uh, competitive foods. Are they allowing vendors to come in and sell pizza or uh, chicken sandwiches or whatever as fundraisers that competes with the, uh, the, nutrition, the more nutritious options that the cafeteria serves? So, um, you know, if there is a policy about that, you know, we would want to enforce that. If there isn't a policy, we might want to put, put one in place. Do they have vending machines? What's in the vending machines? You know, those are areas that we can target for our interventions. And then finally, we go down to the bottom, and there are five phases here, or four phases there. Um, you know, the phase five is implementation. So after we've determined what our intervention strategies are going to be, we implement those. And then the next three all have to do with evaluation. And there are three uh, types of evaluation. There's process evaluation, there's impact evaluation, and then there's outcome evaluation. Uh, you know, this, this tells you how important evaluation is. If you've got, uh, you know, three phases devoted to evaluation, it must be a big deal. Okay, so we'll look a little bit in, more in detail at the various phases. So the social assessment and situational analysis looks at the quality of life, the problems and priorities of the uh, priority population, things like crime, unemployment, welfare, um, you know, level of happiness, um, self-esteem, and so on, okay? So, um, you know, you can do surveys, you can do, you can look at uh, data that already exists and try to determine something, tell the story about the, the community and the people that live in that community. <clears throat> Phase two is where you look at the epidemiological data, uh, look at morbidity statistics, mortality statistics, um, you know, what's the incidence of chronic disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity uh, in that particular community. That helps you to convince people that there's a need and uh, that something needs to happen. And then we look at those uh, educational and ecological factors like pre predisposing factors, enabling and reinforcing factors, and you can look at those uh, predisposing of the knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes that people have um, uh, about, uh, you know, certain things. You know, for example, like we always need to have fried chicken at church dinners. Um, you know, those are things that people believe, you know, sometimes we need to kind of change those attitudes. Uh, enabling factors are things that, um, you know, reinforce, or not reinforce, I'm sorry, use that word, but uh, things that are created by society forces, um, uh, you know, related to access to health care, availability of resources, and things like that. So, 
um, you know, we need to look at those things. Transportation would be an enabling factor. So if you don't have a grocery store in your neighborhood, um, you know, and you have to go two or three or four miles to get to a grocery store, you know, do you have transportation to get there? If you don't, then you're limited to, your options are limited uh, in that area. And then finally, reinforcing factors, so um, things that exist to reward us or, uh, or punish us in terms of our behavior, uh, family, friends, peers, you know, those are all individuals that reinforce our behaviors and our choices. And then, as I said before, the administrative and policy assessment and intervention alignment. So what you're doing is you're looking for policies that exist or don't exist and uh, asking yourself, okay, what, what can we change in terms of policy? What can we implement in terms of policy that would help people to make better choices? Uh, and then finally, uh, we look at the, uh, our interventions. So we look at all of the causes of the problem. We look at policies. We look at the environment. And then we say, okay, we need to do you know, these two or three or four or five things that are going to have the greatest uh, impact on, on the health problem. Phase five is the implementation. And uh, here I want to reinforce that the strategies that we use, uh, we need to make sure that they're grounded in theory, uh, that they're based on evidence, um, so th things that have been proven to work, and that they are you know, what we would call best practices. So once we've done that, identified the interventions, uh, then we you know, implement those interventions. And then final, the final three phases, process evaluation, which looks at uh, the delivery of the program and the interventions, um, the impact, you know, are we able to change people's knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors uh, as a result of the program? And then finally, um, although it might not happen in our, in our lifetime, but we would ultimately want to see a reduction in the incidence of the chronic diseases. So we want to see obesity rates go down. We want to see diabetes incidence rates go down. You know, that's going to take a long time to happen, but uh, we need to keep this in mind that ultimately we want to see these outcomes uh, changing. All right, so, you know, let's pause for a second. Let's think about a health problem. Um, what I've been working on for the last six or seven years is childhood obesity. So, you know, there's a high level of childhood obesity in this community, and uh, specifically, there's a high rate in the Harrisburg community. So, you know, let's think about the social assessment. Let's think about the environment out there. You know, what's conducive to children being physically active uh, and having access to healthy food, and what's working against that? Um, you know, what do we see in that neighborhood in terms of education? Uh, crime, unemployment. Um, you know, make a list of those factors. Then the epidemiological assessment. You know, we can go try to find data on obesity. We can try to find. We can find data on adult obesity. We can find data on uh, um, obesity in children pre-K to uh, to first grade. A um, little bit more difficult to find obesity rates on kids that are, you know, first grade through through eighth grade, but we can extrapolate from from some of the information that's out there. So, you know, what's the what's the current status of the problem? How bad? How does it compare to um, to county rates? How does it compare to the state? How does it compare to the nation? And we can start to get a feel for what the extent of the problem is. Then we, you know, we say, what are the causes? You know, what's, well, we know that uh, people are fat because they don't eat right or they eat too much and they don't exercise enough. But we need to drill down farther. You know, why is it that they don't exercise enough? Their kid's not as active. You know, maybe when they get home from school, the parents won't let them go outside because of the problems in the neighborhood. Um, you know, maybe there's no safe place to go. Maybe there, uh, uh, there's no safe place. Even if there was a safe place, there's no easy and safe way to get there. So, you know, we have to drill down from these causes and we have to say, okay, what's the real cause or the root cause? And then um, address our, our interventions at those. Uh, look at policies. Um, 
you know, look at uh, and the built environment. You know, are there sidewalks there? Um, you know, where do the buses come? Where do they drop the kids off? What happens to the kids when they get home? Um, you know, are the police out there patrolling? Do we have crossing guards? Things like that. And then we try to, again, uh, align our interventions to have the greatest impact. Okay? Hopefully uh, that's starting to make some sense. <clears throat> All right, I'm um, going to go through a lot of these other models fairly quickly. Uh, you can look at the, uh, you know, look at the details in the chapter uh, rather than listening to me talk on and on about them. But uh, you know, here's one called MAP, and I like the title: Mobilizing for Action Through Planning and Partnerships. You know, no one organization can do this by itself, and so you have to get a lot of organizations involved. You know, in Harrisburg, we've got Georgia College, we've got Georgia Military College, we've got the Community Garden Association, we've got Central Georgia Technical College, um, we've got uh, uh, various faith-based organizations that are out there. Uh, the county, um, Parks and Recreation, all of those organizations have, have banded together, have mobilized to try to make a difference in the Harrisburg community. And so there's the phases of MAP. Um, you know, I would uh, direct your attention to page 56 for a diagram of the MAP process. Uh, and the various assessments that need to be done are around the perimeter of that uh, of that model or that diagram. So you can take a look at those. But again, you can kind of see the flow here. Um, you know, organizing for success and developing that partnership or coalition. You know, like Live Healthy Baldwin. Live Healthy Baldwin is a, a coalition. It's a group of a bunch of organizations that have banded together to address obesity. Visioning, you know, determining what it is that we want to accomplish, doing those four map assessments, using that information to identify our strategic uh, areas that we want to work on, formulate the goals and objectives, and then uh, the action cycle is implementation and evaluation. Okay, again, hope this uh, makes sense. And again, these are all just different planning models. Um, some of them might have a little bit different purpose, but you know, we would select one of these or at the most two of these and use those to, to plan our effort. Uh, MAPIT, M-A-P-I-T. So it uh, was developed to help communities implement Healthy People 2020 at the local level. Uh, starts by getting key people mobilized to form a coalition, there's that word again, to improve community. And uh, uh, here, it, MAP it is an acronym that stands for Mobilize, Assess, Plan, Implement, and Track. Okay. And again, hopefully you're seeing the flow. Mobilize, doing some assessment, needs assessment, planning, which is your goals and objectives, implement your plan, and then track uh, is another word for evaluate. All right, now sometimes it's, uh, it's important to utilize communication strategies as well. Uh, and so here's a couple of definitions, one of health communication and the other social marketing. They're a little bit different. Um, you know, health communication, we can utilize a lot of different uh, uh, media, you know, billboards, um, television, radio, and so on to uh, get the word out about something. So if we're trying to... Uh, uh, you know, get people to be aware that there's a problem in the community. We might put a billboard up that shows, you know, did you know? Did you know that um, one out of every two individuals, uh, minority individuals born after the year 2000 will develop type 2 diabetes? You know, boom. You know, you hit them with that. You're trying to raise awareness. Social marketing is a little bit different. You're trying to do something to get individuals to... Uh, to voluntarily engage in a behavior. So, um, you know, it could be something around uh, breast cancer screening or prostate cancer screening or uh, trying to get people who are smoking to quit or trying to get people who are on drugs to seek treatment. Uh, so, you know, we want to try to get people to take action, and that's what we do with social marketing.
Uh, you can probably think of examples of social marketing. The Truth Campaign is one. Uh, there are some around uh, drugs. You know, I've seen billboards. You know, will meth change me? And it shows this very scary-looking character who's obviously addicted to meth. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a, um, a series of, of TV commercials called This Is Your Brain. It showed a, an egg in a frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. You know, any questions? Um, you, may have, you may recall those. So there are um, program planning models that are specifically designed for these kinds of communication campaigns. And, and the most prominent one comes from the CDC, and it's called the SMART model. The first two words in that are social marketing, so it tells you what uh, it's all about. So we're trying to do a marketing campaign to get people to uh, change behavior, adopt behavior, take action. So SMART stands for the Social Marketing Assessment and Response Tool. And so here are the phases. Um, again, you should be able to see the logical flow, preliminary planning, consumer analysis, market analysis, channel analysis. So those uh, second, third, and fourth phases are a little bit different from some of the other models that we look at uh, because here we're looking at, you know, who are the consumers? Um, what are those consumers interested in? I mean, it's almost, it's like marketing. It's, you know, it's, you're trying to convince people that they need to do something, and so you're, you're marketing something to them. And then you look at uh, the channels. So what potentially could we use to get the message out? Uh, who's the priority population? How do they get their information? You know, it could be websites. It could be billboards. It could be, um, uh, you know, TV ads, radio. Um, it could be brochures in a barber shop. So if you know a barber shop or a gas station is a hangout for people, uh, you know have literature there and, and have people there to you know to talk about the problem. And then phase five, you develop your materials, you pretest those on a focus group um, that are like the priority population. And then when you're comfortable with your campaign, then you implement it. And of course, phase seven is. All right, I'm going to go quickly through a few other models. Um, this is one uh, called SWOT. It comes out of our, our business field. It stands for uh, Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. It's a, it's a you know, business people like to do things quickly uh, because time is money. And so this is a good model to use when you don't have a lot of time, when you know maybe some resources have come, come along and you can advantage of that to do something in a community uh, relatively quickly. So strengths would mean you know take a look at your organization, your partnership, and identify what the strengths are. Weaknesses, that's pretty self-explanatory. Look at you know where you uh, where you are deficient. You know, what are the opportunities out there? Where can we make a difference? And then what are the threats or risks to the kinds of things that we want to implement? So again, um, SWOT analysis is something that uh, uh, can be used if you need to act quickly. Um, the first time I taught this class in the Maymaster, uh, I asked the students to look at all of the models and to determine which one um, they were going to use to plan their their health promotion program, and uh, they all unanimously decided on SWAT because of the time frame that we had. Uh, interestingly, the next year when we taught the same class, uh, they didn't use SWAT. They came up with uh, something else. So, um. All right, uh, this came out of Canada, this particular model, and then it was adopted by uh, the World Health uh, Organization, so it's called Healthy Communities or Healthy Cities. Um, you know, the steps are mobilizing key individuals and organizations, so again, that uh, collaborative or partnership, assess the community needs, strengths, and resources, plan for action, implement the action plan, track the progress and outcomes. Uh, again, you should be able to see the parallel between this and the generalized model. Another health communication model from the National Cancer Institute. Um, there are the phases, and you can see the 
see the flow of this, compare this to the other communication model that we just looked at out of CDC, the, the SMART model, see where you can see um, uh, commonalities and differences. And then, uh, you know, this uh, intervention mapping model is a little bit unique. Uh, it was designed because there was a gap in um, in some of the steps to the, or proceed gap in the steps to the precede, uh, proceed model. And so it looks in more detail, so how do we go from data to uh, the interventions? So what do we, you know, how can we best decide when interventions to use? So it adds a little detail there. Uh, the needs assessment, then creating this matrix of change objectives, inter individual, interpersonal, organizational, community, and societal. So what kinds of things do we want to see change? Then let's look for those uh, theory and evidence-based methods, uh, and then um, you know design our interventions or select our interventions accordingly. Another one from CDC, uh, I like the title, it's kind of catchy, Healthy Planet, you know, planet, get it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you see the steps here, priority setting, establishing goals, uh, outcome objectives, strategy, evaluation, and budget. A little bit different than the others, but you still see that logical flow. All right, and so, uh, you know, let's, let's end with this. Um, you know, here are some resources that you can look at uh, to see some of the, um, some of the uh, tools that are out there that, that can help you. Um, first one is a link to uh, something called a Systematic Approach to Health Improvement, which is a Healthy People initiative. Um, and then you've got some tools from healthy people for professionals that uh, are available to help people plan individual and community-based interventions, community toolbox, and then a couple of uh, planning models from CDC called CD Synergy and CD Synergy Lite. Uh, again, it will take you to CDC website and you can look for uh, some of the tools that are there on their website. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of that particular chapter, and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you in class this week.